I will be starting in a few minutes. We're just waiting for the third speaker to join us. Okay, just in the interest of time, maybe we could get started. I'm sure Jan will join us. Um, a warm welcome to- I'm actually on the call, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jan, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so a warm welcome to um, everybody to this edition of the Big Learning Network uh, webinar, in which I uh, will be discussing data triangulation for improved decision-making immunization programs. And um, I'm your host, uh, Catherine Yawana, the Big Learning Network uh, Coordinator. And uh, before we get uh, a, a, um, a very big welcome to our speakers for today, we've got um, three renowned data management um, specialists on board who are going to talk to us about this subject. But um, before we get uh, started, I would like to share uh, some information about um, the housekeeping um, guidelines for this webinar. So we expect all participants to type in the chat box the name and the country where they're connecting from. That would be very helpful for us. And um, if you're um, two or more people on one connection, we'd really appreciate you letting us know, not necessarily the names, but just the numbers of other persons um, who are connecting with you from the same uh, connection point. Then uh, we also expect um, the participants to be muted so that um, the speakers could present without any interruption. And uh, we also anticipate that you will disable your videos so that you don't uh, compromise um, the bandwidth um, for some um, participants. And also just to let you know that there'll be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And um, in the meantime, uh, we do welcome um, questions to be submitted in the chat box and uh, they will be logged and answered during the question and answer session. And also just to let you know that uh, this webinar is being uh, recorded and uh, the link as well as the presentation slides will be shared via the BID uh, website. Okay, so today uh, we'll be talking about, like I mentioned, data triangulation for improved decision-making in immunization programs. Uh, we know that um, you know, most of the successful immunization programs use data to guide um, efficient management as well as you know, uh, tailoring strategies and making decisions for uh, achieving these uh, program goals. We also know that there are many data sources that exist both within and outside the expanded immunization program, um, you know, immunization programs, but um, the collective use of these various uh, data um, is not optimal in most countries. And um, of course, in the absence of such a, you know, perfect data, public health practice has long acknowledged that combining these many pieces of weaker evidence can form a strong basis for making more informed decisions. As such, triangulation 
population, which is a synthesis of two or more existing data sources, is used to address relevant questions for program planning and decision making. So in today's webinar, um, the speakers will introduce the concept of data triangulation in immunization programs for decision making, and they also present examples of data triangulation used in the field. Our speakers will also discuss the development and dissemination of global guidance for data triangulation in EPI programs. And um, you know, they use various sources for these, which include the World Health Organization Scholar Distance Learning Platform. In today's uh, webinar, we're honored to have distinguished speakers from the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the World Health Organization. And I will um, introduce um, our panel for today. I'll start with the two ladies who are both from um, the Centers for Diseases Control and uh, Prevention. Uh, we have, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Angela Montesanti Porto, who is an epidemiologist with, uh, like I mentioned, with the United States Centers for Diseases Control and Prevention in the Global Immunization Division. Angela has 10 years of experience working in program monitoring and evaluation of health service delivery and diseases uh, surveillance programs. Currently, Angela works to provide technical support at global, regional, and country level on vaccine preventable disease surveillance and is a co developer of the Global Guidance on Triangulation for Improved Decision Making in, improved, in Immunization Programs. Welcome, Angela. Next, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Morales, who's uh, also uh, with uh, uh, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She's also in the Global Immunization Division, where she's a medical officer. She's an internal medicine physician and uh, a graduate of um, Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship. And uh, Michelle has five years experience in providing technical support in vaccine preventable diseases at global, regional, and country level. Currently, Michelle works on global rubella policies as well as providing technical assistance on all aspects of rubella from vaccination introduction to confirmation of elimination. Michelle is a co-developer of the Global Guidance on Triangulation for Improved Decision Making in uh, Immunization Programs. Welcome, Michelle. And thirdly, lastly, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Jan Hevendok from World Health Organization, Geneva, Switzerland. Jan is a technical officer in immunization, uh, vaccines and biologicals division, where he focuses on guidance and capacity building for the collection, assessment, and use of immunization data. That includes methods for data quality assessment and improvement, the use of electronic tools and standards for data collection analysis, analysis. Recently, he has led the design and implementation of remote online courses, which uh, most of us um, in the audience uh, are part of. This is the WHO Scholar Program for Data Improvement Planning and collabor in collaboration with CDC, and uh, also on data triangulation for better decision making. Welcome, Jan. And um, I'd like to welcome our panelists uh, once again. This is definitely going to be a very exciting session, so I don't want to take up much of your time. So without much ado, I'd like to invite the panelists to walk us through the presentation. So can I, will you share your screen? Can I, can I stop sharing my screen? Hi, Catherine, yeah, you can go ahead and okay. stop and I will Okay. And Jan and Michelle, when it's your turn to present, just um, tell me me next and I'll hit the next slide for you. Okay. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, with that, we'll just go ahead and um, go ahead and get started since we've got a lot to go through on such a hot topic. Um, so I just want to first share um, this 
uh, these survey results from uh, a recent survey we conducted during um, what Catherine just mentioned, the WHO Scholar Certification course. Um, there has actually recently been one on um, EPI data triangulation. Um, and this was one of the first things that we, one of the first exercises we conducted with the scholars. Um, we just asked them, which of the following best matches your idea of data triangulation? Um, we gave them a few different sort of definitions, um, and as you can see, you know there were um, there were varying uh, agreements on what what data triangulation is. Um, most people um, said that data triangulation is comparing at least two or three data sources. Um, some people said that it's validating data quality. Some people say that it's visualizing data on dashboards or harmonizing data. A few people say that it's sort of more complex predictive modeling of data. Um, everyone's sort of right. Um, but I think, you know, that really sets the stage nicely for what this sort of global project has been on developing um, data triangulation guidance for immunization programs. Um, and one of the first activities we had to do as sort of a larger global technical working group on this topic was to develop a common definition. Um, that definition that we've come up with so far is the synthesis of existing data from two or more sources to address relevant questions for program planning and decision making. Data triangulation identifies and aims to address limitations of any one data source and or data collection methodology and encourages deeper insight through making sense of complementary information and broader context. So I'm not sure if anyone on the call is familiar with the parable of the blind men and the elephant, um, but this is really what data triangulation is like. Um, as you see here, you know, there's a number of blind men and they're all touching a different part of an elephant. One's touching his ear and thinks it's like a rug, one's touching his um, trunk and thinks it's a snake, one's touching his leg thinking it's a tree trunk, um, and it really takes all of the men working together to understand what the bigger picture is that they're all actually touching the same thing and that's an elephant. Um, so triangulation is very similar to that. It takes a lot of different perspectives and data sources um, to really understand, to get a deeper understanding of um, the immunization program you're working in. The next step by the technical working group was conduct an in-depth landscape analysis of how triangulation has in the past and is currently being used um, by public health programs and of course in particular um, EPI. Um, within this landscape analysis we found that there's five types of triangulation generally used by immunization programs um, and you see these here on the the right. Um, so you see uh, check consistency of data across sources, using it as a diagnostic to target program interventions. So for example, measles or polio risk assessment methodologies are great examples of triangulation. Um, estimation of coverage, target populations or disease burden. Evaluation of intervention impact. So for example, um, post-vaccine introduction uh, evaluations are great examples. Um, and lastly, holistic assessment of program adequacy. So for example, disease elimination verification processes. Um, and the main takeaway here is that triangulation is not just used for data validation. I won't spend too much time on this, only to say that um, during the process of developing guidance, we created an, sort of in, an interim product, um, a draft framework, if you will. You can see here on the left um, the cover page of that document, um, and we have a link to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, but this was developed um, between WHO, UNICEF, and CDC with Gavi support, um, and really just outlined what data triangulation is, how to use it, and what the added value is for immunization programs. Um, but I think what's most interesting to, um, to you all on this call at this point um, is the draft guidance that we've come up with. So um, as of May 2020, so we're hitting the end of the month, um, we've come up with, with the working draft um, guidance. Uh, you can see the, the tiny URL link here. Um, it's an active link. You're welcome to, um, to use it. At this point, um, we're finalizing just a few formatting changes to the documents, but they will be uploaded within the next week. Um, so feel free to use that link if you're interested in looking at the guidance. Um, 
But just to give you a bit of an outline on what's going to be included, um, there's actually nine different documents that will be included. Um, and we've tried to organize it by the audience that would be interested. Um, so I encourage, if you're interested, to first take a look at document number zero. Um, it's actually just a two-page cover and brief orientation to the guide. Um, and everyone should definitely um, take a look at that first. Um, and then we have national and subnational documents. Um, so for the national level, there's a general triangulation guidance document number one. And then there's three topic specific annexes around the topics of immunity gaps, program performance, and program targets. And these annexes kind of um, basically just show you uh, very specific examples on how to run through triangulation for each of these topics and give you great examples um, of triangulating different data sources that are available for those for those topic areas. And then for subnational, it's very similar. There's a general triangulation guidance document um, that's uh, much shorter than the national, as well as um, slightly shorter topic specific annexes for the subnational level as in the same topic areas. So what are the benefits of data triangulation? It encourages collaboration across program units and potential for greater data sharing and access. It aids deeper understanding of data through synthesis with contextual information in consideration of data limitations, identifies areas for program improvement, improves confidence in conclusions and in quality of recommendations, and strengthens the health system by building capacity for critical thinking, data analysis, and use within an increasingly data-rich environment. We've tried to outline some minimal criteria for data triangulation. So number one, you should have access to two or more data sources. You should have some minimal level of data management and analysis capacity. We've tried to keep things um, pretty, you know, as simple and straightforward as possible, particularly when it comes to the analysis and a lot of the things that we've outlined in the guidance um, can be done just in something as simply as Excel. Um, and number three, willingness to take action based on the results. The format of your triangulation exercise will probably vary based on the level at which you're doing it, so national versus subnational, um, as well as the frequency. So is this something that you want to look at more routinely, um, or is this a question or a program issue um, that can be looked at on a more ad hoc basis? So some triangulation principles that you should think about before you get started. Triangulation is driven by important program objectives. You use existing data, no new data are collected during the actual exercise. Um, but just to point out that if during your exercise you notice that there are data gaps, um, or gaps in information that require new data collection, that could be something that you provide as a recommendation as a next step. You want to include diverse data sets. Engage a multidisciplinary team if possible. Conduct basic analysis that includes local knowledge in your interpretation. And the results should be communicated for use in decision, improved decision making. So there are two ways to triangulate data. The first way, you may combine different data sources into one analysis. So for example, you know, coverage data and surveillance data into one graph from the start. Or perhaps you conduct separate analyses of each of your data sources and combine through the interpretation at the end. Either way, critical thinking is required to turn data into information for action. And as Catherine mentioned, um, once I go through these kind of general concepts, um, Michelle will actually be presenting on some great um, field examples, both from the national and subnational level to help you kind of understand some of these uh, concepts in context. But I'm going to just go through a couple of brief examples just so you can kind of see um, what we're talking about here and maybe that some of the, the analyses that you've been conducting or some of the analyses that you're familiar with are actually data triangulation already. So here's a great example. Number one, um, this is uh, looking at immunization program impact on diphtheria and pertussis burden. And essentially it's a triangulation of coverage data for DTP3 um, as well as surveillance data, so looking at diphtheria and pertussis cases. Um, so here in the graph, you see the, the line as being your DTP3 coverage, your blue bars being diphtheria cases, and red bars being pertussis cases. And over time, you see that as coverage increases, 
the number of cases goes down. So example number two, while this isn't an analysis example, um, it is a really good example uh, of sort of the triangulation framework. Um, and this example is from um, a guidance on verifying measles, rubella, and congenital rubella syndrome elimination in the PAHO region. Um, and basically, you see all of the different gray boxes basically being different types of data or data sources. Um, and you really need to link each piece of evidence together to understand where you are in the elimination process. So speaking of the triangulation process, um, the guidance that we've developed, um, we basically outlined it as a four step process. Um, with first, ask, um, starting with asking the key question, Step two, identify existing data sources. Step three, summarize data and local context. And step four, develop an action plan. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but just to say in the national um, triangulation overview or the general guidance, um, we did also go into a little bit more depth um, and provided a sort of more detailed 10 step process. Um, it still very well aligns with the four step process, but it just kind of goes into a little bit more detail here. And if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to look at that document. Um, triangulation used for monitoring and evaluation. So you can use triangulation to answer a program question taking many months to investigate, or the principles can be used in day to day monitoring and decision making. <coughs> so for example, um, you can ask sort of the same type of analysis questions each month. Um, maybe you're wanting to do data quality checks at the end of every month. Um, the data sources can be predetermined um, and the analysis can even become on automated like thinking about a dashboard. In both cases, the analysis has a purpose and critical thinking is required to process the data into usable information. So lastly, I'm just going to run through a little bit more detail of each of these four steps within the triangulation process before we go into some examples. So for step one, asking the key question, you want to start by identifying a key program problem and related questions and really think about how do you hope to use the data for action at the end. The question must be answerable and actionable. Action may inform local program planning or where a policy change may be needed from the higher levels. You want to engage a variety of relevant staff from the beginning to help you review examples, brainstorm, facilitate your discussion. And when you think about engaging different staff, they also may have access to different data sources. So that's why it's really critical to think about that um, from the beginning and engage all the right people. So here we outline some criteria for identifying a data triangulation question. Um, the criteria are here, it should be important. Um, is it important based on the priorities of the country or the local area? Um, is the, the, the question answerable? Is there data available to address the question? Is it actionable? Um, do the answers lead to initiation of public health action? Um, could issues identified uh, be changed through existing interventions or new interventions? Is it appropriate? So is this question um, best addressed by triangulation or would it be best addressed by a, a more specific research study or perhaps could even be addressed by looking at a single data set? And lastly, is it feasible? So is there sufficient time and resources to finish the task? And generally, you want to specify and limit the scope based on what can be answered and acted upon. So why are questions important and why did we make this the first step in the process? Making a question is a critical thinking activity. So this really helps you practice that skill. The question helps direct and limit the scope of your analysis and asking important questions engages the audience when telling your triangulation story at the end. Um, and you see here in the box, you know, another really um, great part of this step is to think about what's your initial theory of why the problem exists and come up with um, a hypothesis or a number of hypotheses um, to maybe uh, give you an explanation uh, based on what limited evidence you have to start with and can help you point, uh, help point you in the right direction to start your triangulation investigation. So step two, identify existing data sources. 
You want to identify all relevant data sources, including those not in routine use. So talking with staff and partners, both within and outside your program. So a good example here is if you're looking at maybe a denominator issue, perhaps you want to talk to, um, you know, your National Bureau of Statistics office or your local statistics office um, and engage them in this exercise. You want ac uh, access and effort is required to compile the data into a usable format. Um, so this step can be a bit more time consuming. Um, and one invaluable part of this process that we have found when doing data triangulation um, is really that creating a list or sort of an inventory of all existing data sources and putting them into a well-organized archive um, can really help sort of organize your triangulation exercise that you're working on, as well as aid more regular use in the future. And lastly, you want to consider and note the strengths and limitations of each data source to start with. What data sources should be included in triangulation? Well, overall, you want them to be diverse. This helps you gain a more complete understanding of the program issue. You want them to be independent in terms of the collection method as much as possible. Um, this helps for more, um, uh, is more helpful for assessing and addressing limitations. Um, you want to uh, describe the trends in the process and outcome indicators. And lastly, you want to be sure to match in terms of geography and or time period. And I just listed some um, example data sources here and we go into a lot more detail in the guidance as well as outlining some of the strengths and limitations for consideration. Um, but just to show you here, I mean, there's um, coverage data uh, with administrative and coverage surveys. Uh, there's vaccine supply and use data, service delivery data, surveillance data, and even different population estimate data sources. So step three, summarizing your data and local context. You want to first assess data quality. So thinking about the completeness and internal consistency for each individual data source. You want to evaluate the trends across the data sources, um, both again, considering place and time. You want to incorporate contextual information and local knowledge. Um, and this may seem like a kind of ambiguous concept here, but we have a good example that Michelle will share about how, um, you know, someone conducted a triangulation analysis, but really it was going into the field and talking to the staff to understand what that analysis really meant and why the analysis looked the way it did um, was really critical, was a really critical component. Um, you want to brainstorm multiple hypotheses to explain your findings. And lastly, being honest about the data limitations, so missing data and errors. Um, and that's mostly to say, um, you know, no data source is perfect and triangulation is a wonderful tool to let you use data that isn't perfect. And um, I think it's just important that we note the limitations and have an understanding of what those limitations are um, to really kind of make the more accurate conclusions at the end. So when you're doing the analysis, one really important piece um, that we have found is visualizing and communicating those analysis and that data um, to key stakeholders is a really, really important piece. Um, I think, you know, I think we've all been there where we see a presentation um, with just so much great data, but it's a bit overwhelming um, and you sort of lose the bottom line of what you were really trying to understand um, by the end. So you want to think about, you know, what's the best graph or disaggregation to see the patterns related to your initial question. You may want to try several options and compare and see what's best <coughs> for visualization. Excuse me. <coughs> you may want to annotate with important context to aid interpretation. So think about adding circles or arrows on maybe text boxes or benchmark lines. And again, we'll have some really great examples here in a bit on that. And then do the trends across data sets match what the expectation is? So there's um, thinking about areas of agreement and disagreement, taking a critical view of silence, like zero or missing data, um, requires uh, knowledge of how the data fit together and the data limitations. 
Um, and just to show you here, um, this graphic on the right is from our, the WHO Euro office. Um, they've created a really wonderful guide on effective communication of immunization data um, and really touch on um, some really great exercises and, um, and points on how to best visualize and communicate data. So this is just a little chart chooser that they've come up with. Um, and I definitely encourage people to take a look at that resource. Um, so again, thinking, uh, we have here some examples. So, you know, when you're thinking about expected trends, um, there is some, some basic knowledge that you'll want to have before looking at your triangulation analyses. Um, and so that way you can make the proper interpretations when comparing different types of data. Um, so we have some examples here. Um, the first example comparing um, two different types of coverage data, so administrative coverage and survey coverage. Um, in a perfect world, what would we expect to see when we're comparing both of those data sources? Um, we'd expect them to essentially be equal, um, but of course, in reality, there are considerations um, of why maybe those, those may not be equal. Um, so quality of reported data, population movement, role of the private sector, um, maybe robustness or lack thereof of survey methods. Um, the second example here is looking at coverage versus stock data. So doses administered as coverage and vials used and shipped from stock data. Um, and again, what would we in an ideal world expect to see? Um, well, those may not be um, exactly equal, um, but you would expect them to generally be going in the same direction, right? Um, and again, there are considerations for this here. So vaccine presentation, you know, is the vial, if it's a one dose vial, maybe you would expect it to be um, exactly equal, but a lot of times um, perhaps there's a number of doses in a vial that you'd need to just be aware of. Um, are there wasted or sacrificed doses? Are there buffer stock practices or informal exchange networks? Um, things like that you just want to make sure you consider. And lastly, thinking about like coverage and surveillance data, um, what would we expect to see here? So generally, you'd expect those to be sort of going in opposite directions, like as coverage goes up, you'd expect cases of disease to go down again in an ideal world. Um, but there's some considerations as to why that may not be happening with your data, um, perhaps program history, like when was a vaccine introduced or supplementary immunization activities conducted. Um, the disease epidemiology, and of course, the surveillance performance. So last step for develop an action plan. Um, well, the first part of this step is really communicating the findings and the results of your triangulation to the proper stakeholders um, or decision makers. You want to have simple key messages that are tailored to your target audience, and you want to tell a story with your data. So think about, you know, visual information is processed much faster than words. Um, you want a logical flow, so prioritizing analyses by, you know, sort of what makes the most sense and what is most important for them to understand. Um, and even perhaps showing some case studies of relevant. And then lastly, as much as possible, you want to make some recommendations um, based on the triangulation results. So when thinking about making an action plan, you know, the action may be at your administrative level or other levels. You want to obtain input from people that will be tasked with actually implementing that plan. And you want to think creatively about solutions, especially if resources are limited. And you want to prioritize based on what's feasible for short and long term. And so here in the box, we just kind of show you some examples of recommended actions, um, perhaps supportive supervision activities to improve data quality, um, revising microplan guidance to use local growth rates, um, catch up vaccination in areas with coverage gaps. And now I'm actually going to turn it over to Michelle, um, which is personally my favorite part of the presentation she's going to go through some really um great real life examples of how these were done in reality michelle great thanks angela so i'll just go ahead and get started with a few of the identified program issues and some of the key questions we can ask for data triangulation analysis so if we identify a program issue of inaccurate target population estimates and these are all at the national level one of the key questions we might ask is, does the target population estimate for national immunization program align with known demographic trends? 
If the program issue is assessing program performance and data quality, we might ask which districts with low performance and or inconsistencies in data quality require follow-up. And finally, if the program issue is unidentified immunity gaps, we could ask, does surveillance data suggest there are immunization coverage gaps? Next slide. Angela, are you able to switch the slides? Yeah, sorry, hold on. It's... No problem, thanks. <laughs> Forget about that, there it goes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so this first example is for target estimates, and these are growth rates for 2017 to 2018 across data sources in country X. So on the left, we're seeing three EPI data sources. We have EPI census projections, microplan, and also BCG doses. And for all three of these, we can see that they have a positive growth rate. And this does vary from 1.30% down to 0.70%, but all are positive. On the right side of the graph, we can see two additional sources, the Bureau of Statistics Census Projections, as well as the UNPD projections, both of which have a negative growth rate. So for remembering the key questions we might ask for target estimates, we can see that the EPI target estimates are not quite aligning with uh, known demographic trends. And this might indicate a problem that needs further investigation. Next slide. Sorry, it keeps freezing on me. Okay, so for program performance, um, here we have a map of District Pena 3 administrative coverage versus coverage survey for 2016. So the administrative coverage on the left is showing greater than or equal to 90% coverage or all blue in all districts of the country compared to the coverage survey that happened uh, in 2016. So looking at similar data that shows a significant variation. So here administrative coverage data is overestimating. It's hiding subnational coverage gaps. Next slide. Moving on to immunity gaps. We're looking at confirmed measles cases by age versus vaccination coverage in a particular district from 2018 to 2019. So on the x-axis, we can see the age of cases uh, in 2019 in the blue bars and 2018 in the orange bars. And we can also see overlaid uh, the coverage for MCV1 in the gray line, MCV2 in the yellow line, and then a few different SIAs that occurred back in 2014, 2010, and 2006, as well as the ages that those should have covered. Um, if you click one more, yeah. Um, we can see that here, most of the cases are in the under 10 age range, and the majority of those children have not been reached by an SIA. So they have not been covered by one of the blue, green, or red lines there. In addition, some of them have had recent low coverage. Uh, so again, most of the cases here are happening in birth cohorts not yet targeted by the SIA or with recent low coverage. Moving on to example key questions at the subnational level, if we have identified inaccurate target population estimates as a program issue, we could ask, do the current target population values capture everyone in a catchment area? If the issue is assessing program performance and data quality, we can ask which health units under my supervision should be prioritized for visits or follow-ups. And if there are unidentified immunity gaps, we can ask, does administrative coverage in my district or health facility appear to be accurate? So let's look at comparing target estimates across data sources. Here we have an example from a health facility their 2019 microplan target was quite high, and this is the line uh, in yellow, at 32,484. We can also see in the green line, there was a large increase in BCG uh, doses given between September 2018 and July 2019, which was found in DHIS2. So if we click one more, uh, we can see those are the areas where they were given just a big increase in BCG doses compared to years prior. Well, in the past, the microplan uh, was a green, where the microplan and BCG doses administered were quite close. And in between the two census projections, we can see that this big increase was actually due to an in-migration from a flood that occurred um, back in 2018. And this was verified when we went to this health facility. If you click one more, 
we can see that this health facility actually calculated their own growth rate and made a change in their microplan. So this is an example, even at the very local um, health facility level, how you can make a difference in getting more accurate target estimates. Next slide, please. This graph was actually made by a surveillance and immunization medical officer who we, made, uh, who we met while we were uh, developing the global guidance. Um, and he took this training on data triangulation to heart and was able to do some really great analyses on his own in his city corporation. So this graph is showing us program performance in terms of penna doses available and used versus doses administered in a city corporation from 2018 to 2019. So here, this orange dashed line at the top of the figure is showing the need with buffer. And we can see that throughout 2018, or the left half of the graph, the supply was actually below what was required. It was always below this need with buffer. Uh, if you click one more, we can see uh, that there was very good agreement between the doses given and doses used. So if we look at this gray and yellow lines, they're almost always perfectly overlapped. So we know that there, the doses given and doses used seems to be quite accurate over time. And I click one more time, yeah. You can see that there are these occasional drops in the amount of penavalin that's given. And what this uh, surveillance officer found was that this, this was occurring because there was not enough supply to the area. So he actually presented this data to the district EPI office and was able to improve the supply chain. So we can see that the amount given was much closer to the need with buffer during 2019 in the second half of this graph. Moving on to another uh, example of program performance. This one is a comparison of different sources of surveillance data. This is looking at aggregate or IDSR uh, cases in the, blue, in the blue columns compared to case-based databases in the orange columns. So here we can see from 2014 to 2018, the aggregate number of cases was always greater than the case-based cases. And there are some reasons why this could be. Perhaps there was incomplete case investigation, but we can see that there's a much smaller difference between the two systems starting around 2017. So this can be investigated more closely. Perhaps there was an increased uh, use of the case-based surveillance system starting in 2017. Perhaps now there is uh, just one or two people in charge of entering data into both of the systems, so they're, mo they're more closely agreeing. Um, but either way, this is a useful piece of information to see how those systems are evolving over time. Next slide, please. Now this is an example of immunity gaps uh, at a health facility. So here we're looking at measles administrative coverage in 2018 and 2019. You can go to the next one. We can see that coverage in 2019 is now 100% for both MR1 and MR2. And maybe this is perfect data, but we should also ask ourselves, can this be a data error? Or can this potentially be fabrication to have 100% for both antigens? Next slide. So to investigate this more closely, we looked at confirmed measles cases by age and vaccination status in this area. Next. In general, this, this health facility is doing quite well. So we can see there are very few cases overall. Uh, however, once we look at this age and vaccination status, we see that there's evidence of delayed vaccination. So in the nine month to one year age range, these children were zero doses with confirmed measles in spite of being eligible for one dose. So this was a country that gave MCV1 at nine months. We also see some children in the one to four year age range who have only received one dose when they're eligible for two doses. So we actually went to this health facility to investigate why this was and the field investigation found that they were not vaccinating sick children. So this is another example of how at the health facility level even, you can use your surveillance data to help you correct practices. And in this instance, we were able to ensure that this already well-performing health facility was able to improve their performance even more by correcting the practice of not vaccinating sick children. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a measles line list and the names have been changed, but this was very similar to one we saw in a uh, country uh, where developing the data triangulation guidance. So we did highlight a few of these uh, lines on the line list to kind of strike your attention. And if you look at the village, you can kind of see that there's a trend where there's probably quite a few cases in Yellowtown or Yellow, 
depending on how this was spelled. And it looks like based on the subdistrict, there is probably a problem specifically in subdistrict B. And this might seem very obvious, but it's important to know how your line list works in your country. In this particular country, if the spelling was not exactly matching perfectly, there was no flag for an outbreak. So unless someone actually manually sat down and looked through this line list, they would not have been able to notice that there was an outbreak in Yellowtown Village. In this particular country as well, the subdistrict had to be written out as a ward number. So unless it was written very specifically, again, there was no flag of an outbreak. If we're looking at the date of onset in the final column, we can see that all of these cases occurred within about a two week period, which is telling us this is very likely a cluster or an outbreak that's occurring in this area. So it's important to sort of sit down with your line list and focus on time and space and ask, are we missing outbreaks? Are there automations that can be improved? Is there maybe spelling errors that are occurring? Is it possible that, that we are really missing something that we need to investigate further? Next slide, please. And finally, these are some opportunities for an integrating triangulation with existing activities. So when we do upload the guidance later this week, you'll see that it can be quite extensive, but we don't want you to, to feel like triangulation has to be a separate activity every time. This can be integrated with other activities. So for instance, routine analysis, feedback on reported data can incorporate this. EPI data review meetings can be held monthly or quarterly, annual desk reviews, periodic in-depth assessments. There can also be ad hoc evaluations of intervention impact or program implementation, outbreak investigations. It can be part of a data quality reviews or an EPI or VPD surveillance review. It can be incorporated into trainings of mid-level managers and supportive supervision. And finally, dashboard design can be improved to automate some of these analyses. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jan to give us some information on the Scholar course. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michelle and Angela. Um, so my name is Jan Grevenok. I will just talk very quickly about uh, the Scholar course that we organized uh, around data quality and use, and then specifically around, about data triangulation. Uh, so Angela, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So first of all, what are scholar courses? And I've seen uh, quite a few people in the room who actually have been scholars or have been part of the scholar uh, community. And so I see uh, Mahmoud and uh, Kelvin and Gift and, and others, and I'm probably missing a few more. Uh, but it's, it's a remote learning platform that is organized in a collaboration between WHO and the Geneva Learning Foundation. Um, it actually started a few years ago around uh, immunization strategies. So the GRISP approach, so a methodology for kind of um, routine immunization uh, str strategies and practices. Uh, that was the first one. Then there was one around uh, covered service kind of organized by Carolina uh, Danovaro, who you might also know. Um, then we had one on equity specifically. Uh, so these are kind of the routine immunization strategies, but focused on equity. And then the one that I took uh, responsibility for, the ones on data quality and use. So uh, we kind of started with kind of um, the first two courses. I mean, one that we repeated actually was around uh, data improvement planning. So how do you uh, detect and solve problems with data quality? Um, I saw Balthazar, for example, in the chat box asks, you know, what are the root causes for such discrepancies? So this is exactly what we will, will try to kind of solve in uh, that level one course on data improvement planning. Uh, so how do you detect problems, first of all? How do you find the root causes for those problems? And after you find those root problems, root causes, how do you uh, uh, kind of uh, implement improvement activities or interventions that will uh, help you solve that. So um, I actually, so I started with that because I thought, you know, I was at that point, I was writing a guide and I'll just send the link to that, uh, the monitoring handbook. Um, I was writing it at that point two years ago and unfortunately I'm still working on that, but uh, here it is and it's kind of uh, pretty much coming together. And uh, so the good thing is we have been, we have been able to use it already a few times in those kind of capacity learning things um, efforts. So 
what are they then? I would refer to it, I would think of it as kind of six to eight week sprints um, with kind of a lot of people like 200 to 400 learners per cohort, uh, which is a lot of people. There's massive interest, there's energy, there's really kind of a lot of demand for that kind of capacity and kind of uh, belonging to uh, a wider learning effort around that. So the first time I think we had kind of more than 3000 applicants, like in total for the two courses, we had more than 4000 applications. Uh, we managed to onboard actually uh, 1800 and we had kind of 1000 finishers of level one. And um, this year, or actually last year, when we were kind of working with the CDC colleagues on data triangulation, we were also looking for a way to kind of extend that learning a bit and say, okay, so now that we have talked about data quality improvement and, and data improvement planning, um, should we focus on data use? Uh, and then this methodology that uh, CDC people, colleagues were actually working on at that point, uh, looked like a very interesting approach to do that. Uh, and I also think that, um, using a guide like that in a scholar course or in a kind of a, a learning course is actually a really good way to kind of see the rubber hit the road um, because guidance can often be a little bit uh, theoretical and it's not until you really interact with people that actually live those problems and those issues uh, day to day that it becomes much more concrete and you can actually see that um, where that all come together in a way. Um, yeah, Angela, next slide, please. So who are the scholars? So they come from um, a bit everywhere. So just to say that we do the scholar courses in French and English. Uh, I must say actually the French market, let's say, is very much underserved by global community. So a lot of these efforts are in English. And to be honest, like the, 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 the relative interest and kind of the energy from French speakers is actually even more so, impressive uh, still than the English one, even though both of course are very um, well attended and, and have a lot of good interest. Um, about half or more of the scholars are actually from the sub-national level, so either at the state, regional, province level, or district and even health facility level, which I think is also a really good mix and that really helps us kind of, um, helps us really kind of, uh, bring all these people together and actually all learn from each other, which I think is also a really good uh, added value. Um, next slide. So how does it look like? What does the format look like? So we organize weekly discussion groups. So every week in those six weeks or eight weeks, there will be a group that kind of keeps people on track with, um, with, with the work. Uh, we also do weekly webinars. So far we have actually done 17 webinars and we repeat that like in French and English. So, so far it's 34. Um, and for the data triangulation uh, course specifically, so we talked about data triangulation in general. So the national level guidance uh, that the CDC colleagues had, but then also applications at the district level, which I think is even more interesting because then there's a, a lot of things to be learned from, from participants. Uh, we also had a webinar uh, delivered by Gavi, uh, so Gustavo was there to talk about the Gavi guide on analysis and the kind of analysis Gavi would like to see during a uh, joint appraisal, which was very interesting as well. We had kind of a, a, a practical webinar on visualization, so what kind of uh, graphics do you use for what kind of purpose? And finally, we talked about equity assessments, uh, coverage and equity assessments, kind of a, a new kind of UNICEF methodology that uh, actually also uh, touches that area and for which a lot of data sources exist. We do community assignments, which means basically it's homework. It's basically kind of just assignments that help you build a skill or kind of think through a problem. And then the most important thing is what we call a creator project. So every learner has their own creator project. And the idea is to make this very much linked to something that people would do in their real job in reality as well. So. In level one, this was kind of uh, make a data improvement plan for your context. And in level two, which is still being, uh, con being going on, I mean, we haven't really finished that yet, but we asked people to ask a question that is of interest to them and that is relevant in their context and that will help them solve problems for the immunization program or the public health program they're working with. And uh, we asked them to then think out of the box, uh, think out of the box for the data sources, use more than one data source. So what I think the the big thing that we often see basically is that, um, well, first of all, maybe people don't ask kind of um, 
inquisitive questions all the time, right? But the second thing that we see is that people are really stuck in using uh, one data source and that's often that monthly uh, administrative system, so the monthly reports. And that is often not enough, basically. We have to ask people to really consider more than one data source, whether they're qualitative or quantitative. Uh, then make a good analysis and come to a conclusion. So this is kind of an analytical work that people are doing. And again, so we proposed a number of topics, but uh, reality is always kind of bigger than guidance and people come up with like very interesting uh, additional topics. Uh, and quite a lot of people right now are actually working on the question of what is the impact of COVID in immunization programs and how can I plan for that to kind of catch up after the COVID uh, story. Um, yeah, so I think it's really always very interesting and we learn a lot from the learners actually. Um, so this is the format, but I think there's also like, this is uh, a sauce with uh, three secret ingredients, I would say. And, and the first ingredient is learning by doing. So the fact that uh, it's not really lecture based. So even if there's discussion groups, it's really kind of more about community building. So you learn by uh, doing and actually make that creative project and, and and that is really the, the crux of it. The second thing is that we use peer review. So you learn a lot from each other, uh, but you also learn by reviewing somebody else's work. And I think that's actually a, an eye opener for everybody that once you are asked to kind of peer review other people, people's work, you come out of that and you learn so much from that. So I think this is really a, an amazing experience. And, and actually for me, it was a big um, eye opener, as I said. And the third one is community. So kind of the scholars is not just a course that you're doing, for example, clicking through an online module. It's really kind of, um, you're in it together. You're with a community. There's these, we have this kind of concept of the accompanists who uh, help the newcomers. Um, and there's a few accompanists in the room I see. Um, but, but really it's kind of the sense of belonging and the fact that you can uh, talk about these issues that are really common in many places in the immunization program and you can talk about these things with other people that makes it so interesting, I think. So we have some questions for next steps of that and then I'll stop and hand it back over to the uh, main organizers. Uh, but face, basically I think for me, the big questions are going forward. Uh, how do we want to balance kind of repeats of what we have done already kind of immunization um, so data improvement planning and data triangulation or kind of try to propose and come up with new topics. Um, I think if you have new, if you have repeats, it's interesting for that group of people who are already in, uh, but you might have to do repeats also to give additional people the chance to come in as well. Um, the second question I have is kind of, do we want to continue with this one size, one size fits all or do we want specific formats targeting different groups? Uh, so I think so from the feedback that I hear from people and, and actually from my own experience, I know that this is very, very intensive. It's a lot of work um, and it might not be feasible for everybody to actually engage in, in this kind of um, time um, commitment. So I have uh, an experience myself is that I kind of, um, hi Lemon. Lemon, I think you're uh, on unmute. So maybe if you unmute Lemon Sabo. So the, the question I had is that, for example, I tried to enroll in, in, um, in this course on, uh, what's the name, Teach to Reach, and I basically dropped out after two weeks because I couldn't handle with all the volume of the emails and all the work. So I think we probably need to think about uh, the needs of different people. Um, and finally, the last question I guess that I'm work thinking of is, would there be a place or a need for regional and or country level scholars where you, for example, take the SOPs and the policies and the guidelines in one country and build courses around those um, that are then much more specific um, to, to, to those people's uh, context. And basically then that would also be a very nice way to, uh, to roll out and make sure that everybody in, in one country is at the same page, for example. And we could leverage that on the kind of the very active country groups that have formed, for example, in Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Pakistan, India, you see a lot of people that, um, that really have kind of taken this forward and want to kind of continue on that path. And I'll leave it to that. Thanks, Jan. 
Um, and just uh, the last couple of slides we have here, um, just to share with you all, um, we do we did provide a, a bunch of resources that we included in earlier slides of the presentation here for everyone. Um, so please feel free to look at those. Um, and I won't go through this long list of acknowledgements, but just to say that um, this data triangulation guidance uh, development has been a huge effort made by many, many people um, at all levels. So um, thank you to all. Um, and with that, we'll maybe turn it over back to Catherine. Um, and I know we're hitting the top of the hour, um, but I think I know I can stay a bit longer for, for questions and discussion. I'm not sure if Michelle and Jan can, but thank you. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Oh, Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Thanks, Catherine. Oh, okay. Thank you so much uh, to the speakers for today. That was um, simply amazing. And um, I like, um, you took me back to childhood when you brought that slide with the, with the story about the, about the elephant. And um, I think it's true in terms of uh, data triangulation. It's really, really true. Because then you imagine what everybody's thinking about it with their own views. So thank you for the concept. So um, I think we've got into a stage where now we should be looking at um, uh, the questions uh, that are being posed out there. Maybe for a start, we can get into the question by, um, there was a question by um, uh, Baltazar Chilundo. He was uh, asking about, he says data triangulation or vaccine coverage has uh, have issues from most, almost all countries. Um, especially when you compare administrative data from uh, survey data. Why is it that administrative data are uh, interpreted as overestimated? And um, he's saying that, you know, remember that, um, you remember the denominator issue? Census data as a source of admin vaccination coverage and for the survey is just the denominator captured in that survey. But what can be the root causes for such discrepancies? Are you able to take that one? Um, well, I would say that probably warrants its own webinar. <laughs> um, we, we did try to, um, you know, I think the one important thing just to say more general uh, is that, you know, data triangulation um, may not and probably won't um, get down to necessarily the root cause of why um, things are the way they are, um, but it would sort of, it sort of helps um, you identify where, what the problem is um, and perhaps maybe more specifically where the problem is occurring. Um, so just to sort of point that out there, I mean, there, there's many other resources and many other people that have been looking at denominator um, um, as an issue. Um, there's a, a denominator guide um, by WHO, um, which we've also referenced in our guidance um, that can get a little bit more into depth about um, how you can make some perhaps corrections or, you know, recalculations of your target denominator that I would recommend um, people to, to look at. Um, uh, Jan or Michelle, do you guys have anything to add? Uh, I definitely agree with you, Angela, and I will say that we don't always take um, the surveys as automatically being more accurate necessarily than administrative coverage. It, it was more so a suggestion that we should look more closely to see if, if maybe we're missing something when they don't necessarily align as well. But again, we try to incorporate as many data sources as possible, and you can try looking through the immunity gaps annex once we upload that as well for more examples of how to more closely look at coverage. Um, and triangulate that with surveillance data to get a, a more realistic picture of where there might be immunization coverage gaps. Um, but I agree, just looking at those two data sources, those two maps that we showed might not give you the total picture. And I definitely, and maybe, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jan. Maybe just to add to that, that uh, so agreeing with what is being said, I would just say that uh, it's important not to jump to conclusions. So I think that data triangulation can indeed I mean, point you quite clearly, quite clearly out that maybe one data source 
<coughs> excuse me, is deficient, so they can't all be uh, correct. And we often see indeed that kind of like, we see maybe low survey coverage, we see outbreak of diseases and continued transmission of disease. And then we see, for example, very high coverage, sometimes even over 100%. I think everybody has seen that at least once in their life in immunization, right? And then the question is really, so what's happening there? I think as Balthazar asked, what are the root causes for that? I wouldn't necessarily always think it's denominators. I mean, denominators are definitely a big cause of concern and we might try to use different um, sources for that to see if the denominators are kind of uh, feasible and correct. And, and there, are, there are reasons why denominators might be off because kind of census data is old and projections are done um, in a very uniform way and they don't take into account, for example, urbanization uh, and, and kind of different demographic trends in different parts of the country and all these reasons. But we also have to acknowledge that there's also kind of numerator problems as well and that sometimes either there's kind of system issues or there's kind of people over reporting or there's kind of um, no real desire to, uh, or no time maybe even to kind of capture the data well. And I think as Balthazar said, it's basically the main tool there is actually do root cause analysis. So in that level one course, we say, uh, ask five times why this is happening, right? So you see a problem, so ask now why, why is this problem it's, is presenting itself? And if you dig deep enough, you will find probably some issue that's really underlying. And we kind of try to bucket that and we say kind of it might be an issue with the people and their motivation or their skills and their knowledge. It might be a people with the tools that you're using um, or it might be um, a problem with kind of uh, processes, uh, governance, uh, or it might be something indeed like something quite exterior that you don't manage yourself really, which is kind of the uh, the, the wrong census data or all census data and, and, and the denominator issues arising from that. Over. True. Um, did you want to say something, Michelle, or is it Angela, before I get into the next question? Um, no, just to say, definitely encourage you to look at both the denominator and axes that we have included in the link, as well as, um, as Jan mentioned, you know, numerator issues can also uh, be a contributing factor. Um, so looking at the program performance, and uh, which helps you sort of look at that as well. And I know there were a few questions on when those documents will be in the link. So we're going to upload those within the next week to just have the most final versions available. But you can keep that uh, tiny URL link that's in the presentation uh, just as reference for when that will be uploaded in the next week. Excellent. Um, this one, I think, is directed to Jan, where um, it's coming from somebody by the name of Hugo Longa. He's asking, is there going to be a same consideration for those who are, were interrupted in the data triangulation course because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, yeah, very quickly. So I think uh, the first consideration is that we actually extended the deadline by a week. So people um, like in the English courts still have until the end of this week where they were due last week for their work. And with the French court, we will, it will be in two weeks, I think, from now that they are finally due with their job, with their work. Uh, but then we're actually going to close it. And um, I, I, I say I wouldn't despair because like if you're really kind of like uh, caught up in the COVID crisis now, it will probably be the same for at least a few more um, months, I think. So it's like it's not going to change very soon, but we will then... Once, back, once things are back to the new normality or the old normality or whatever the normality or the abnormality will be, then we will try to find a way. And actually, I think one of the things that we learned is, of course, that uh, remote learning is, is going to become at least as important uh, as it was before after COVID. And then we will, I think, um, offer kind of the same kind of courses uh, around data triangulation and data use uh, again. So it's like, I wouldn't despair about that. Great. Uh, yeah, I think there were a number of people who dropped uh, out of the course because of the COVID pa pandemic. I think it caught everybody unawares. And uh, thank you so much for extending um, the, the deadline. Um, are there any other questions? You could raise your hand so that you could we could unmute you. You speak. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions. No hands showing up. 
No other questions. I have I'm not seeing any other questions um, in the chat. Well, um, having said that, I think we'd like to thank our presenters for um, taking us through this um, uh, most amazing and very interesting um, subject. It's a very good topic on data triangulation. And uh, maybe I could um, just ask the speakers to each one of them in a couple of uh, um, minutes each, just to give the participants any last words, words of encouragement for those ones who are still struggling with um, how to deal with their data. Oh, wait a minute, somebody's got a hand up. Just before we do that, let's, just, let's not disadvantage this person. Clement, um, you are muted. We've unmuted you, you can speak. Did you want to ask a question, Clement? Clement, would you like to say something? Please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. You can go ahead with your question or contribution. Okay, my question is the issue in uh, immunization that uh, has actually been uh, the issue of the denominator. My question is, how can one actually solve this issue practically? How can we one overcome this challenge of denominator affecting our data, our immunization data? Okay, Hello. over to our speakers. Thank you very much. The speakers will take this one. There's a question on how we can so, uh, try and solve um, the issues of denominators. I think, um, thank you so much, Clement, for that question. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, immunization program questions of the century, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think there's, I mean, there's so many things that go into denominator issues. Um, and as Jan mentioned, I mean, even just with the limited information we have from the data that we do collect at the different levels, um, you know, there are also numerator issues that can, um, can feed into that sort of problem that also really need to be considered. Um, I don't think that's a question that has a simple answer. And I think there are many, many groups all looking at that issue. Um, and I think our sort of role with the triangulation guidance around denominators, um, it's sort of like, I would consider almost a first step into solving the denominator issue. Um, it's really, again, looking at the different data sources um, you know, Clement, I'm not sure which level you're from, if you're from the national program in your country or maybe a subnational or even health facility level. Um, but I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I've seen in the field is that people aren't necessarily utilizing um, or getting access to different sources of denominators for their area even though those data may exist somewhere. Um, so that was one thing when we were piloting our data triangulation guidance um, and really developing it was, um, I think, what the country had found most useful um, was really just sort of pulling together all of the different sources, um, you know, the different um, uh, census projections, both from the immunization program, as well as just the, the Bureau of Statistics office for the entire country um, at the local level. Um, they, there were also other sort of data that they could look into and just really kind of putting it all together and, and looking at the data and seeing what the trends were um, and seeing sort of where their program denominator fit with the other data sources. Um, it really just kind of got them just to start thinking more about, um, you know, what other data or what other questions should they start looking into. I think it's something that um, I don't think one triangulation exercise or one analysis is going to really solve your problem. Um, I think it's something that it's an iterative process that you just have to sort of um, keep working on and, and refining your question to really understand. Um, and just to say, I think, you know, one thing that we really recognize, particularly with denominator um, is, you know, local context was really, really important. I think one of the examples that we showed in our presentation um, from a health facility or, or sub district level, um, you know, we saw a huge jump in, in their target estimates. Um, we had no idea why that was occurring and, and thought it was either a data entry error or something was going on. But 
um, you know, they recognized that there was um, a change in their population due to, you know, a huge in-migration um, from a neighboring area. And that was something that was really um, critical. So, um, I mean, I don't know if Jan or Michelle have, have other things to add. I'm sorry. I wish I had the magic answer, um, but I think... Just to say yeah, I'd like to maybe come in and I, and I think first of all I think I mean you you did ask the most frequently asked question I think in immunization as uh, Angela said so definitely there is a problem there um, what, what I would say well there's actually two questions about denominators or two issues and the first issue is that denominators are often outside of our control and if I say our it is both for the person at the district level for example who is being told to use this target as for uh, the national level program manager who has been told that you know kind of denominators are standard across programs um, which is probably a good thing because actually population is something we all share and, and we have the same population so we should have like one source of denominators and the best possible um, uh, people to work on that is that national bureau of statistics probably so there are ways to kind of improve the denominator technically um, by using the right demographic uh, parameters but i think <laughs> What we try to be, uh, what we try to do is kind of make people from programs aware of those uh, techniques, but really it needs to be driven by demographers. Um, I think somebody in the Dropbox in in the chat asked, can we have like um, access to um, that denominator guide? So actually, we mm -hmm. organized a few webinars, and in that webinar folder we have also um, that denominator guide. So I'm just going to copy that and, and put it in the chats uh, so you can refer to that if you if you like. Um, but I think the main problem is also that we have to accept that this is something first of all out of our control and second of all it's something that will only be be improved very very little by little so very um, incrementally basically and over time maybe over a long time so i think often the question is not how can we improve the denominator because we're not empowered to do it and we we might not have the tools for it uh, but second is like but what can we do in the meantime to ask to answer our questions and and for for example prioritize districts um, and take uh, corrective action without necessarily uh, the, the typical denom denominator or, or population target and then I think there's a lot of answers that could open themselves up. And one of the answers could be kind of by using more geographical information systems and, and kind of like information that we get from satellite imagery. Um, or you can, you can use um, different data, for example, to help you order vaccines, for example, if that is the issue. So you can look at previous vaccine consumption instead of only the target uh, population. Um, or you can actually, uh, use, for example, at the local level for micro planning, you can use some local source of, of population data, for example, enumerations of people or uh, household lists. And the problem then is that um, we probably shouldn't call that the denominator or the population estimate, but something for operational planning, because like the national program won't allow that or somebody in the Ministry of Health or the HMIS will say, no, you're using the wrong target. But then you can still say, well, I'm using an operational target for local planning. And I think that is fine because the biggest issue actually with denominators is not necessarily always at the national level, even though some countries do have problems with that. Uh, but the biggest issues are at that very local level, right? Where um, there's a lot of uncertainty around um, the evolution since the last census and did people move out of this district or move in? Uh, often what we see is that in urban districts, a lot of people moved in, so now the denominator is too low and in urban in rural districts you see the other way around um, so ideally over time those things get improved and solved and, and made better but in the meantime I think we should think about alternative sources for our operational decision making and I think there really kind of triangulation could uh, could help so it's not really triangulation to help solve the denominators but triangulation to help solve your um, operational decision making about who am, am I prioritizing for micro planning or uh, where I'm, where do I need to send, uh, how much vaccine do I need to send or all of these kind of really uh, practical questions or for my, I mean, micro planning and supportive supervision, all these kind of things, what do I prioritize? You can actually try to move away and not look only to uh, administrative data, but also look to other sources of data. And I think that's really where the data triangulation has most added value for me. 
Wonderful. I hope that um, responds. Um, I think you vaguely responded to Clement's question. I mean, it's, you know, we should be looking at other sources of, uh, of data. Um, I think we've uh, run over time. And um, I, I think I was in the process of asking the speakers to just in a, a couple of minutes each, just to give um, some encouragement to our participants um, in terms of our data, you know, data management and how they could use triangulation. And also maybe, um, Jan, you could um, speak a little bit more about, you know, the different uh, scholar pro programs that will be starting soon. So in a couple of seconds each, beginning with um, Angela. Sure, I just want to thank everyone so much for attending. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this is all just sort of a first step. And I think um, I'm sure you are already doing um, a great job at trying to, to use all of the data you have. And hopefully the information that we've provided in the guidance um, helps and at least, you know, gives you a bit more information on uh, perhaps how to use the data um, as effectively and efficiently as possible. Um, just to say that there's an email address within um, the, uh, the cover page of our guidance. So if you have questions um, or want some materials, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I think even Jan in the resources slide of our presentation um, provided you the links to some of the East Scholar materials on data triangulation. Um, so yeah, I, I hope um, this is all at least a good start for you all and um, happy reading and um, best of luck to everyone. Um, in the current situation, especially. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle? Thanks, Catherine. So I think Angela covered that uh, follow-up quite well. Um, I, I would just encourage everyone as well to try to go through some of the guidance. Um, what we found very interesting in the field was that just starting this discussion around data, all of the different sources that are available and kind of how to really bring that interpretation of these analyses into focus was, was something that was very um, promising to see and um, really well taken up in the field as well. So I would again encourage you to go through some of that triangulation guidance. We're always happy to hear your feedback as well since this is still kind of in development, um, not quite a final form just yet, um, but we're happy to answer any questions through that email address that Angela mentioned and hope that you all find this useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jan, anything you can tell us about the upcoming courses? Uh, unfortunately, so we uh, we don't have kind of anything in the schedule or kind of being planned right now because it, it also depends on our funding cycles and we, we also don't have like much visibility on that. So it's like um, we hope to be organizing maybe uh, in the second half of this year or next year again courses and then we will widely distribute this also through the uh, learning network, the Bit Learning Network uh, platform. Um, but I can't really uh, commit or, or actually say what, uh, when or what. I think it will focus mostly on data use again, uh, more than quality. Um, but but yeah, that's that's as far as I can say. And in terms of like motivation for people, I think uh, I, what I think for this data triangulation approach is that um, it can help empower you to kind of look outside of the box and actually also be creative and instead of kind of trying to keep on using what hasn't worked before, like look at some other things that might work now. So I think that's actually also interesting. Thank you so much to all the speakers for that, um, you know, the, for those encouraging words. And um, thank you so much for walking us through the guidelines, you know, the benefits of data triangulation, the various concepts and the context in which they can be used. Uh, we learned about, um, you know, the use of effective uh, communication through various, uh, you know, through visualization of our immunization data. And we also learned about the various, uh, um, you know, documents or resources that are there. So um, thank you very much to the speakers and we hope that you'll be available to respond to, the, to any questions that might uh, pop up after this, uh, webinar because I'm um, sorry we're not able to take in all your questions if there were any questions that came up later but feel free to um, share the, the the questions uh with the uh, with the BLN and we'll forward them to the speakers 
Uh, we're really grateful that all of you could uh, join us. Let's uh, take advantage uh, um, of the resources that uh, have been shared uh, online. And uh, also just to encourage um, any of the scholars who may have dropped out of uh, the data triangulation course, let's take advantage of the deadline extension. And um, also let's look at um, the feedback that we need to provide to the guidelines that have been shared. And also just to mention that uh, I'll repeat to say that the recording and the slides will be shared um, in due course. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. We know you're very busy people. Thank you so much for being a part of this uh, webinar. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, my pa. How are you? Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Hello, good. Yeah, that was great. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation. Yeah, we hope to get another good one by next week.